The Things They Carried, Chapter 20, Part 4. Creepy, Azar said. Wet pants and goosebumps. He held a beer out to me, but I shook my head. We sat in the dim light of my hooch, boots off, listening to Mary Hopkins on my tape deck. What next? Wait, I said. Sure, I mean, shut up and listen. That elegant high voice. Some day, when the war was over, I'd go to London and ask Mary Hopkin to marry me. That's another thing Nam does to you. It turns you sentimental. It makes you want to hook up with curries, girls like Mary Hopkin. You learn, finally, that you'll die. And so you try to hang on to your own life, that gentle, naive kid you used to be. But then after a while, the sentiment takes over, and the sadness, because you know for a fact that you can't ever bring back any of it again. You just can't. Those were the days, she sang, as our switched off the tape. Shit, man, he said. Don't you got music? And now, finally, the moon was out. We slipped back to our positions and went to work again with the ropes. Louder now, more insistent. Starlight sparkled in the barbed wire, and there were curious reflections and layerings of shadow, and the big white moon added resonance. There was nothing moral in the world. The night was absolute. Slowly, we dragged the ammo cans closer to Bobby Jorgensen's bunker, and this, plus the moon, gave a sense of approaching peril, the slow, belly-down crawl of evil. At 0300 hours, Azar set off the first train. The night seemed to snap itself in half. The white flare burned ten paces from the bunker. I fired off three more flares, and it was instant daylight. Then Jorgensen moved. He made a short, low cry. Not even a cry, really. Just a short, lung and throat bark. And there was a blurred sequence as he lunged sideways and rolled towards a heap of sandbags and crouched there and hugged his rifle and waited. There, I whispered. Now you know. I could read his mind. I was there with him. Together we understood what terror was. You're not human anymore. You're a shadow. You slip out of your own skin, like molting, shedding your own history and your own future, leaving behind everything you ever were or wanted or believed in. You know you're about to die. And it's not a movie, and you aren't a hero, and all you can do is whimper and wait. This, now, was something we shared. I felt close to him. It wasn't compassion, just closeness. His silhouette was framed like a cardboard cutout against the burning flares. In the dark outside my hooch, even though I bent towards him, almost nose to nose, all I could see were the glossy whites of Azar's eyes. Enough, I said. Oh, sure. Seriously. Azar gave me a small, thin smile. Serious? He said. That's way too serious for me. I'm your basic fun lover. When he smiled again, I knew it was hopeless. But I tried anyway. I told Azar the score was even. We'd made our point. I said, no need to rub it in. Azar stared at me. Poor, poor boy, he said. The rest was inflection and wide eyes. An hour before dawn, we moved in for the last phase. Azar was in command now. I tagged after him, thinking maybe I could keep a lid on. Don't take this personal, Hazard said cheerfully. It's just my own character flaw. I like to finish things. I didn't look at him. As we approached the wire, Azar put his hand on my shoulder, guiding me over toward the boulder pile. He knelt down and inspected the ropes and flares, nodded to himself, peering out at Jorgensen's bunker, nodded once more, then took off his helmet and sat on it. He was smiling again. You know something, he said. His voice was wistful. Out here, at night, I almost feel like a kid again. The Vietnam experience, I mean, wow, I love this shit. Let's just shh. Azar put a finger to his lips. He was still smiling at me, almost kindly. This here is what you wanted, he said. You dig playing war, right? That's all this is. A cute little backyard war game. It brings back memories, I bet. Those happy soldiering days. Except now, you're a has-been. One of those American legion types. Guys who like to dress up in a nifty uniform and go out and play at it. Pitiful. If it was me, I'd rather get my ass blown away for real. Seal. 
like soapstone. Come on, I said. Just quit. Pitiful. As are for Christ's sake. He patted my cheek. Purely pitiful, he said. We waited another ten minutes. It was cold now and damp. Squatting down, I felt a brittleness come over me, a hollow sensation, as if someone could reach out and crush me like a tri Christmas tree ornament. It was the same feeling I'd had out along the Song Trabong, like I was losing myself, everything spilling out. I remembered how the bullet had made a soft puffing noise inside me. I remembered lying there for a long while, listening to the river, the gunfire, and voices, how I kept calling out for a medic, but how nobody came, and I finally reached back and touched the hole. The blood was warm like dishwasher, dishwater. I could feel my pants filling up with it. All this blood, I thought, I'll be hollow. Then the brittle sensation hit me. I passed out for a while, and when I woke up, the battle had moved further down the river. I was still leaking. I wondered where Rat Kiley was, but Rat Kiley was in Japan. There was rifle fire somewhere off to my right, and people yelling. Except none of it seemed real anymore. I smelled myself dying. The round had entered at a steep angle smashing down through the hip and colon. The stench made me jerk sideways. I turned and clamped a hand under the wound and tried to plug it up. Leaking to death, I thought. Like a genie swirling out of a bottle, like a cloud of gas, I was drifting upward out of my own body. I was half in and half out. Part of me still lay there, the corpse part. But I was also that genie looking on and saying, there, there, which made me start to scream. I couldn't help it. When Bobby Jorgensen got to me, I was almost gone with shock. All I could do was scream. I tightened up and squeezed trying to stop the leak, but that only made it worse, and Jorgensen punched me and told me to knock it off. Shock, I thought. I tried to tell him that. I tried to say shock, but it wouldn't come out right. Jorgensen flipped me over, pressed a knee against my back, pinning me there, and I kept trying to say shock, man, treat for shock. I was lucid. Things were clear but my tongue wouldn't fit around the words. Then I slipped under for a while. When I came back, Jorgensen was using a knife to cut off my pants. He shot in the morphine, which scared me, and I shouted something and tried to wiggle away, but he kept pushing down hard on my back. Except it wasn't Jorgensen now. It was that genie. He was smiling down at me and winking, and I couldn't buck him off. Later on, things clicked into slow motion. The morphine, maybe focused on Jorgensen's brand new boots, then on a pebble, then on my own face floating high above me, the last thing I'd ever see. I couldn't look away. It occurred to me that I was witness to something rare. Even now, in the dark, there were indications of a spirit world. Azar said, hey, you awake? I nodded. Down at Bunker 6, things were silent. The place looked abandoned. Azar grinned and went to work on the ropes. It began like a breeze, a soft sighing sound. I hugged myself. I watched Azar bend forward and fire off the first illumination flare. Please, I almost said, but the words snagged, and I looked up and tracked the flare over Jorgensen's bunker. It exploded almost without noise, a soft red flash. There was a whimper in the dark. At first I thought it was Jorgensen, Please, I said. I bit down and folded my hands and squeezed. I had the shivers. Twice more, rapidly, Azar fired up red flares. At one point, he turned towards me and lifted his eyebrows. Timmy, Timmy, he said. Such a specimen. I agreed. I wanted to do something, stop him somehow. But I crouched back and watched Azar pick up a tear grass grenade and pull the pin and stand up and throw. The gaff gas puffed up in a thin cloud that partly obscured Bunker 6. Even from 30 meters away, I could smell it and taste it. Jesus, please, I said. But Azar lobbed over another one, waited for the hiss, then scrambled over to the rope we hadn't used yet. It was my idea. I had rigged it up myself, a sandbag painted white, a pulley system. Azar gave the rope a quick tug, and out in front of Bunker 6, a white sandbag lifted itself up and hovered there, 
in a misty swirl of gas. Jorgensen began firing, just one round at first, a single red tracer that thumped into the sandbag and burned. Ooh, Azar murmured, quickly talking to himself. Azar hurled the last gas grenade, shot up another flare, then snatched the rope again and made the white sandbag dance. Ooh, he was chanting, starlight, star bright. Bobby Jorgensen did not go nuts. Quietly, almost with dignity, he stood up, took aim, and fired once more at the sandbag. I could see his profile against the red flares. His face seemed relaxed. He stared out into the dark for several seconds, as if deciding something. Then he shook his head and began marching out towards the wire. His posture was erect. He did not crouch or squirm or crawl. He walked upright. He moved with a kind of grace. When he reached the sandbag, Jorgensen stopped and turned and shouted out my name. Then he placed his rifle muzzle up against the white sandbag. O'Brien! He yelled, and he fired. Azar dropped the rope. Well, he muttered, show's over. He looked down at me with a mixture of contempt and pity. After a second, he shook his head. And I'll tell you something. You're a sorry, sorry case. I was trembling. I kept hugging myself, rocking, but I couldn't make it go away. Disgusting, Azar said. Sorriest fucking specimen I ever seen. He looked out at Jorgensen, then at me. His eyes had the opaque, spiritless surface of stone. He moved forward as if to help me up. Then he stopped. Almost as an afterthought, he kicked me in the head. Sad, he murmured, then headed off to bed. No big deal, I told Jorgensen. Leave it alone. But he led me down to the bunker and used a towel to wipe the gash on my forehead. It wasn't bad, really. I felt some dizziness, but I tried not to let it show. It was almost dawn now. For a while, we didn't speak. So, he finally said. Right. We shook hands. Neither of us put much emotion into it, and we didn't look at each other's eyes. Jorgensen pointed out at the shot-up sandbag. That was a nice touch, he said, and almost had me. He paused and squinted out at the eastern patties, where the sky was beginning to color up. Anyway, nice dramatic touch. Someday, maybe, you should go into the movies or something. I nodded and said, that's an idea. Another Hitchcock. The birds, you ever seen it? Scary stuff, I said. We sat for a while longer. Then I started to get up, except I was still feeling the wobbles in my head. Jorgensen reached out and steadied me. We even now, he said, pretty much. Again, I felt that closeness, almost war buddies. We nearly shook hands again, but then decided against it. Jorgensen picked up his helmet, brushed it off, and looked back one more time at the white sandbag. His face was filthy. Up at the medic's hooch, he cleaned and bandaged my forehead. Then we went to chow. We didn't have much to say. I told him I was sorry. He told me the same thing. Afterwards, in an awkward moment, I said, Let's kill Azar. Jorgensen gave me a half grin. Scare him to death, right? Right, I said. <laughs> what a movie. Or we just kill him. <laughs>